Welcome to the next episode of Feltovich Fit, Endurance Reconsidered. If you don't want to hear me talk and you just want to start training, that's fine. Feel free to skip to the time below. The inspiration for this episode came from Strong First's Strong Endurance Seminar. If you're a strength and conditioning coach and you're only going to attend one seminar this year, that's not a bad choice. The workouts contained in this episode, along with any errors or mistakes, are of course my own. A common way that people classify physical attributes is aerobic endurance, anaerobic endurance, and strength, each with different types of training to develop those attributes. The problem is that those distinctions aren't as clear as you might believe, and they aren't the most important distinctions for health and overall athletic performance. Let's take aerobic endurance for example. You want to do aerobic respiration? Congratulations, you're already doing it. That is, of course, unless you're one of those odd ducks who watches my videos while doing wind sprints. Let's take anaerobic endurance. You want to do anaerobic respiration? Spoiler alert, you're not going to be doing it for very long. No matter how good of shape you're in, once you go anaerobic, you've got at most a few minutes of rapidly declining performance in you before you need to recover. The endurance money ball, therefore, is anaerobic threshold. That is how much work you can do before you go anaerobic. And there is some hard data to support the importance of that metric for athletic performance. 10 kilometer run times are 94% correlated with anaerobic threshold. Max VO2, on the other hand, is only 32% correlated with 10 kilometer run times. Max VO2 is largely a vanity metric. It's the endurance athlete's equivalent to, say, maximum bench press or arm size. Next, let's talk about strength versus endurance. For most athletes and for most activities, the key to building endurance is paradoxically to get stronger. Let me give you an example. How many times can you lift your one rep max? It's not a trick question. You can do it one time. How many times can you lift 50% of your one rep max? You should be able to do it at least a dozen times and after a brief rest period, you could do, come back and do it again if you wanted to. So if you double your strength, then what was your one rep max is now only 50% of your one rep max and you can do it all day long. That's why the key for building endurance for most athletes and for most activities is to get stronger. You're probably wondering, how do we incorporate all these great principles into one workout? The way that I do it is repeated submaximal effort every 30 seconds, focusing on basic exercises for 30 minutes. Those three things, submaximal effort, repeated exercises, basic movements, is gonna accomplish too many things to list, but here's an attempt. I had to write them down so I wouldn't forget anything. It's gonna minimize your workout time. It's gonna minimize oxidative stress because we're using submaximal effort. Oxidative stress has been implicated in heart disease and cancer, among others. It's gonna build mitochondria, which is also gonna to help to combat oxidative stress. Gonna build muscle, which most people need to do. It's gonna minimize joint stress because we're not using super crazy heavy weights. It's gonna help develop mobility through exercises such as the squat. It's going to help activate the glutes through exercises such as the kettlebell swing. If you sit too much, with it, which is most people, you're typically going to have weak underactive glutes and posterior chain. It's going to minimize recovery time. So if your job involves physical labor, such as a firefighter, military, etc., that's going to be important. Also, if you're an athlete, you might have multiple training sessions, perhaps multiple training sessions even in the same day. Recovery time is going to be paramount. And last, the high, the high number of repetitions with the same exercise is going to help you practice those movements and become more efficient with your, uh, both your movement and both and more efficient with your nervous system. Similar to another favorite workout format of mine, Grease the Groove, which will be a topic of a future episode. I elaborate on each of those benefits in the accompanying PDF, so I encourage you to check it out if you're interested in learning more. The last thing we'll talk about before we get started training is programming. A particular word of caution with this workout format, if you're going to increase the kettlebell that you use by one size, you could easily increase your total workout volume by more than a ton thanks to the miracle of multiplication. In this particular workout, I jump up two kettlebell sizes 
I did that by necessity. I, I don't have a 28 kilogram kettlebell. If you're going to do that, you got to be particularly mindful of two things. One is you got to make sure that you've really mastered the previous kettlebell size. And two, you got to dial back the reps substantially so you're maintaining a similar total volume until you've mastered the heavier kettlebell size. Enough talking, it's time to train. Welcome to the first of two anti-glycolytic training workouts. Today is going to be ballistic day. The workout is going to be 30 minutes. On the 30 second mark, we're going to do two kettlebell swings with a 32 kilogram kettlebell. Adjust for your needs as necessary. And then on the one minute mark, I'm going to do one clean and jerk with the left hand with the 32 kilogram kettlebell. You're probably wondering why the breakdown. I'm approximately three months post-op on the shoulder, so obviously that's too soon to be doing a hefty clean and jerk with the right shoulder. When you're injured, you have one of three options. You can either stop training entirely and you can turn into a blob, or you can try to train with the injury and make it worse, or you can do what we're doing today, which is continuing to train but working intelligently around the injury. If I weren't injured, what I would simply do is on the 30 second mark, I would do one clean and jerk with one hand. And on the one minute mark, I would do the clean and jerk with the other hand, repeating for 30 minutes. That was a very challenging workout, especially since I jumped up two kettlebell sizes. I don't have a 28 kilogram kettlebell, so I had to go from 24 to 32. However, you can make those kind of jumps if you do so intelligently. Just because you're not spiking your heart rate the way you would be in, say, high intensity interval training, don't think that this isn't a challenging workout. It's a long, slow grind. However, on the other hand, I'm not so wrecked that I couldn't, for example, if I were a firefighter, go out and carry fire hoses, climb ladders, carry people, do all my firefighter duties. Or conversely, if I were, say, an athlete in training right now and I had a practice session later in the day, I could do that. that which is just another reason why AGT is such a great overall training modality for general physical preparedness. Welcome back. It's two days later and I'm fully rested and recovered and ready to go. That's another one of the advantages to this type of training is rapid recovery times. Last time was ballistic day. Today is going to be strength endurance day. I don't like to mix the two. I like to train different attributes with different adaptations on different days. The workout today is on the 30 second mark. I'm going to be doing one clean and one side lunge to either side. And then on the one minute mark, I'm going to be doing a clean to a squat. And on the one minute and 30 second mark, I'm going to be doing one clean to an overhead kettlebell press with the left side. Again, I've got the shoulder injury, hence the modification. I'm going to attempt the workout with the 32 kilogram kettlebell. However, I'll have the 24 kilogram kettlebell handy in case I need to bail. Don't let your ego get in the way. Some signs that you overdid it and you need to go to a lighter kettlebell are you're unable to maintain rhythmic breathing. You're unable to maintain rhythmic lifting. Your form starts to break down. Or worst case, you actually miss a lift, which means you definitely overdid it and you need to ex execute your exit strategy and go to a ke lighter kettlebell immediately. Other than that, it really is that simple. I'm looking forward to another great workout.
That was an awesome workout. I'm showing that it's less than two minutes since I finished. I wanted to film this quickly after the workout to show you the level of recovery, the level of fatigue that you should be at with this type of training. I could do more if I wanted to. I wouldn't be super happy about it, but I could do more. Uh, thanks again uh, for the great workout. Uh, the next thing we're going to lift is we're going to lift that finger. And we're going to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more material like this. Also, leave any questions, comments you have, or anything else you'd like to see in future episodes. Thank you again. God bless.